Great. So uh, welcome everybody to our live demo. My name is Maria Selakovic and I work as a developer advocate at, at uh, Create.io. And today I have a great guest, uh, Sirini from Superset. He's actually developer advocate at Superset. And um, we also have a great topic, a uh, practical one. Uh, we will show you how to actually use CreateDB and Apache Superset to make some cool uh, visualization of time series data. So our agenda for today is relatively simple, but super effective. First, we will tell you a few words about Apache Superset and CreateDB just to warm up the session. Then we will introduce the time series data set that we will actually try to visualize and get some interesting insights from this data set. Then we will show you how to actually register CreateDB connection in Superset. Then probably the main part of this, of this um, live demo is going to be actually a practical demo on how to build effective, fast and customizable dashboards. And then we will also give you a few words about Superset semantic layer, why it's important and why it's a really, really cool feature. So yeah, before we actually start with the general introduction, I would like to show you what is going to be our end result today. So our end result is going to be some very fast dashboard in Apache Superset that actually shows you um, how the electricity is consumed in, in several households in France. And uh, from uh, this dashboard actually, and from the charts we're going to build, you can actually get the cool insights about the trends in electricity consumption or like which area of the, of the one particular city are actually consuming most or even which uh, groups of appliances are, are taking the most, the most electricity and contributing the most to the, to the total uh, consumption. So the, the key point here is like that we want to show you how you can get some very useful insights from a very raw uh, data and how you can actually build these insights in a very, very effective and fast way. So Srini, I would like you to tell us a little bit more about uh, Superset and uh, yeah, why it's so popular tool these days. Awesome. Hey everyone, great to, great to meet everyone. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Superset um, and let me hit next slide. So what is Superset? Uh, Superset is an open source, modern uh, business intelligence platform. So the focus is really on helping different personas in an organization explore and visualize data quickly. So we have a big kind of emphasis on speed. Uh, we really want to help people get value very quickly without having to kind of manually write code for uh, most of the common charts and uh, workflows that they're actually looking to do. Um, can you go back? Sorry. Um, and the key thing with Superset is because of, because of the open source nature and some of the early bets made in the architecture, uh, Superset can actually work with pretty much any SQL speaking data engine. So Superset's written primarily in Python and uh, JavaScript, um, so it's very kind of web, web-based to web-oriented. And because of the Python backend, uh, the early contributors decided to make a big bet on SQL Alchemy, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and that basically enables Superset to kind of treat a, a lot of these common SQL databases in the same way. And it also unlocks some of the no code um, features, which I'll uh, talk about in the next few slides. The last part, is that there's a large gallery of charts that ship with Superset right out of the box. I believe there's about 60 or 70 uh, that come right when you uh, install Superset. And the, the nice thing you know, with Superset being open source is that these uh, charts are actually customizable. Um, you do it does require kind of a decent amount of knowledge in, in JavaScript, React, the Node, NPM ecosystem. Uh, but for people who have that front end skill set, you can build charts for your organization and, and make them available uh, to, to end users in your superset deployment. And so all this is really because of open source. A lot of the charts and databases we support um, are not even from the core contributors. They've kind of come from other organizations or other individuals that are passionate about contributing. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of, 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 the, of the overview for, for superset. 
Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about why the tool even exists, right? So like the idea for an open source BI platform is it's not super intuitive or, or obvious. Historically, most BI tools have been uh, closed source. Uh, Tableau was kind of the original big uh, player in the space. And I'm a big fan of Tableau. I kind of consider it the Photoshop uh, in this space. If you really want fine grained control and uh, pixel perfect designs, uh, and they have a fantastic no code interface as well. Uh, then I think Tableau is, is excellent. Uh, but the, the main challenge uh, that Max, who uh, is our founder and CEO at Preset and the original creator of Apache Superset when he was working at Airbnb, uh, was they're running into a lot of limitations. And a lot of that was actually related to the fact that Tableau was uh, remained closed source. So at the time they were experimenting a lot with Apache Druid and, and Presto query engines and uh, they just, Tableau just didn't support it. Uh, and that's, that was just a limitation that they were stuck with. Uh, they were, you know, they were kind of tired of paying 50 to hundred dollars a user a month for each license. Many users internally are just gonna, you know, show or uh, uh, view existing charts and dashboards anyway. And lastly, it was still very windows centric. So it wasn't cloud native. It wasn't, um, kind of designed at the time for the web in mind, which has kind of become the main popular collaboration medium. Um, and he's written a little bit about why he, why he kind of started the project and why open source was kind of the big bet that they made, uh, within Airbnb for a lot of their data tooling, but especially for Apache Superset. This is kind of sets the stage for some of the frustrations and limitations that they were running into. And uh, no doubt this is actually, I'm sure why a lot of open source databases like Crate and none others are started, uh, or because the existing solutions just uh, weren't cutting it. And um, so regarding, there's kind of two main workflows in Superset. So the first workflow is what we call Explorer. So this is the no code chart builder. So this is kind of really enabled by SQL Alchemy. So for people who don't know, SQL Alchemy basically is a little bit of a translation layer between the world of kind of object oriented programming and SQL query uh, type of syntax. And so it lets, uh, in our case, you know, for Superset, we use uh, the SQL Alchemy layer to expose a no code interface. So in the front end, people can kind of choose uh, declarative uh, kind of values for the types of columns they want in a chart, how they want it filtered, that type of thing. And behind the scenes, um, the Python kind of object oriented syntax can be generated and, and kind of interacted with, with the database uh, directly, which is, which is powerful. So this really caters to the kind of what we call the explorer and consumer persona. So within the BI landscape, there are a lot of different types of personas and users. Uh, and a, a big contingent is, are, are people that are kind of not SQL natives. Um, they kind of have, they maybe can recognize SQL or they're conversational in it, uh, but they're not fluent. And so being able to quickly uh, clone an existing chart or build charts quickly without having to write raw SQL uh, is a super powerful way of, of working. And that also kind of enables a lot of speed for, for organizations. The second kind of workflow we have in Superset is SQL Lab. So this is our in-browser based uh, SQL IDE. So this lets you write raw SQL and this is untouched by SQL Alchemy for the most part. Uh, it's basically going to hit your database directly. So if you want to write a complicated join, you know, you want to join eight tables together or you need to reformat your data in a specific way or to change the column type, that type of thing where uh, you're not able to make that change on, in your physical table. Um, this is a great kind of escape valve for you to uh, format the data and prep it for visualization and then uh, make it available. And so this really caters to the kind of more the data scientist, data engineering persona to kind of help unblock people or just do a more custom uh, ad hoc um, SQL query. Um, so this is kind of a quick uh, screenshot of what the Explore interface looks like. So on the left, you have the no code explore panel. So this is where you can choose the visualization type in the, in the top, uh, you have uh, the time grain and the time range. So, uh, you know, across what time do you want uh, the data to be filtered by and in what way? So do you want hourly kind of by millisecond or all the way to, to months and, and years, depending on the type of chart you want to create, uh, you have a lot of control over, over that. And all this is just kind of powering the final raw SQL query that's sent to uh, the create database anyway. You can also pick your metrics. Uh, you can filter out things. So in this case, we're visualizing 
the number of messages posted per different Slack channels in the superset Slack community, actually. And we have this channel called GitHub Notifications, which just includes raw, raw notifications from the superset GitHub repo. That's not, it's not really that interesting for understanding how humans in the Slack community are interacting and in what channels. So it was, it turned out to be dominating the chart. So I just kind of filtered it out um, and then group by name. So each color in the chart um, is grouped by the unique kind of uh, channel name uh, as well. So all this is kind of generating SQL, uh, which you'll kind of see in the live demo, uh, but you're not kind of manually writing every line of SQL yourself, uh, which is pretty great. And um, a quick kind of slide on, on SQL Alchemy for, for people who aren't familiar. You have your query that comes in um, and then Python's kind of, you know, Python doesn't speak SQL natively. It's very much in the object oriented world. Um, so being able to understand how to connect to the database and how to uh, use object-oriented syntax is, is pretty powerful here. Uh, and you'll also notice that uh, the other thing that's enabled here is that the explore parameters, so all the things I talked about on the last slide, the filter criteria, the metrics, the columns, um, those kind of map very cleanly to Python object-oriented syntax. Uh, where you have, uh, you know, instead of uh, instead of kind of the where in where in kind of raw SQL text, you have a dot where as a function uh, or a method rather in the SQL alchemy call. So the Python backend and superset is able to kind of take the the explore context in the no code interface that people are providing, uh, understand it, and then use it to kind of generate raw SQL. Uh, and each each database has different flavors of SQL. So we were able to tap into the uh, excellent create DB SQL alchemy driver um, on our on, on on the database's behalf, basically. And so this is an example where you have uh, Python syntax, and then you can see at the bottom the final uh, query that's actually generated, the final SQL query. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of Superset. I'll pass it to Maria to talk about create. Thank you, Sri. That was actually a really nice introduction to Apache Superset. I already can see that there are some questions. That's great. Please be free to post your questions. Actually, maybe we forgot to mention, um, you can find the Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen. And uh, yeah, we will take all the questions at the, at the end of the demo. Um, but now I would like to, <laughs> to say a few words about CreateDB. Um, CreateDB has been actually with us since 2014. It's, um, it's under active development um, and it's, of course, open source. Uh, it's, it's free to use under Apache License 2.0. So what is like a killing feature of CreateDB database is that's distributed horizontally scaling database for data intensive applications. Um, it's actually a good choice for any type of data, but we can say that is a perfect choice for the event data, which are usually described as a high volume non-transactional uh, data. Also, you can use it for a, a mixed structure and unstructured data. Uh, you can rely on CreateDB to do fast analytical queries and highly scalable depo deployments. So as I mentioned, it's just not an ordinary database. It's actually a pretty cool database, which combines the best of two worlds. One, <laughs> SQL, uh, and another one, no SQL world. So um, CreateDB is um, uh, compatible with the Postgres interface. And yeah, it uses SQL as a query language. This is a language that um, most of the developers are familiar with, and it's actually pretty easy to, 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 to start using CreateDB. If you know SQL, um, you're, you're more or less there. Um, it's also cool that uh, table schemas are represented in a relational format, which is again, uh, a format uh, that is familiar, that many developers are familiar with. Um, so actually there are no um, weird structures of, of your data. You can have a pretty nice overview of how the data are structured, but you still have some uh, advantages of no SQL which means that um, you can, for example, use dynamic schema. Uh, the architecture of CreateDB is uh, fully distributed and it's based on a share nothing uh, principle. 
uh, CreateDB also use, uses uh, in the background uh, Lucene engine, which means that all columns get indexed by default. And this indexing actually comes with a very low overhead. And indexing all columns or all like properties of the objects you're actually going to store in CreateDB means that you can do a full text search over, over, this, uh, over these properties and over the columns. So when it comes to the consistency model to achieve high ingest performance, uh, CreateDB uses eventual consistency, which is a little bit different at, um, than Postgres, which is um, based on um, immediate consistency. So being Postgres uh, compatible means that you can use CreateDB with many, uh, many popular and many really cool open source and, and commercial tools that actually implement Postgres via protocol. One of these tools is Superset, and today I'm going actually uh, to show you how you can um, connect uh, your CreateDB instance with the Superset. It's, it's, it's easy and it can be done in a couple of minutes. But if you're more in favor of the, of the managed solution, of course, one can use um, CreateDB Cloud, which is fully managed database as a service. Um, it's based on uh, CreateDB in the back end, but it also adds some additional features such as full and incremental backups. Um, it also has a cloud UI that um, gives you a nice way to actually monitor, uh, monitor your cluster and to, to do easy scaling. Um, you can deploy it very quickly and uh, today it's uh, available on Azure and AWS. So um, before actually going into, into, into real demo, I would like in, in next few slides to show you how you can actually download CreateDB and how you can start using it. Um, I would not do it, you know, like from, from, from my uh, PC right now because it takes some time to, to, to start it and to actually load some data, but I can assure you that it's quite fast. So the best way to download CreateDB or like the easiest way maybe right now is to run it from a tarball. You, um, you can use the command that you can see on this slide. And once the command actually finishes, it will uh, open you the admin UI uh, in the browser. And the admin UI is actually giving you um, not only the, the interface for querying, but also it gives you a little bit more information about your cluster, such as how many shards are there, how many nodes are there. It also gives you some way to do a cluster cluster monitoring. So if you just, you know, like run the command, it will download the latest version of CreateDB and run admin UI in your browser. So that's as simple as it is, but of course there are other different ways how you can how you can run uh, CreateDB, and I would like to invite you to check our documentation page on, on our website. Um, the next actually thing I would like to talk about is about data set that we are going to visualize today. And I already mentioned what is going to be about. Um, so we are using one of the very um, well-known data sets uh, on energy uh, consumption in, uh, for single houses in France over several years. Um, this is actually one of the very typical Internet of Things data sets that you can find these days. And uh, what this data set actually gives you, it gives you, you know, like for, for each timestamp, it gives you some values how a certain, you know, house consumed electricity. Uh, measured at this timestamp, but it's not only the total consumption that the house had, it also gives you a little bit more detailed data on, on the consumption based on the, on the utility type that you're using in this, um, that you're using in, 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 in the house. So for example, it gives you some values, how much kitchen has consumed, how much laundry or climate control. And uh, this data set is interesting because you can get some insights about, for example, what is what are the general trends in energy consumption, especially if you have a couple of years. Uh, you can also you do some predictive analysis on, 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 on this topic. You can also see what are the differences across various locations. And also you can do a little bit more profiling um, of, the, of the regions. 
uh, based on, on different utility types. Um, so yeah, the slide also shows the table schema and the best way actually to import this uh, schema in the in CreateDB is to use copy from um, command. Um, for people familiar with, with CreateDB and Postgres in general, this is, um, this is command they know how to use. It's relatively simple. You actually create a new table and then you actually load data from um, uh, from uh, from uh, data source. So um, if you want to use uh, and, and try it out yourself, uh, we have actually a um, blog post that, uh, that uh, describes these topics in, in even more details. So you can access it and, and download the data and try out in CreateDB using the simple command uh, query some of the some of the of the data and you will see actually how how it looks like uh, from the from the CreateDB console. Uh, now, once you have your data loaded, the next step you would like definitely to uh, to register uh, CreateDB connection in a superset. Um, one important prerequisite to take to to do actually before doing this before registering the connection is to install CreateDB Python library in the same Python context as superset. So especially if you're using superset from the, um, as a Docker image, if you're using preset cloud, you really don't need to, to think about this. The driver is already installed. Um, and registering the database means you open a superset instance, uh, you add a new, um, uh, database. Actually, you go to the data dashboard and then select a new database connection. So in general, the, the, the format that you should uh, use is based on <clears throat> uh, SQL Alchemy URI format, where you need actually to give uh, the username and password or your database connection uh, following with a, with a link to the connection and port the connection is listening to. So for example, if you have just run your local CreateDB instance, this is relatively simple, simple to do as you can see as you can see on this slide. Um, in uh, Apache Superset, you have a way to test connection before actually connecting to the database. Um, but before doing this, make sure that uh, in advanced uh, tab of the superset, you also import this extra line, which actually specifies further the server that is that is uh, listening to this connection. Um, this is one of the one of the uh, workarounds we we recently discovered for connecting to the for connecting Apache superset to the HTTPS connection. And then you're ready to start. And I think, uh, Sirini, you're also ready to start, right? Showing us what we can do yep. with the Apache Superset after we establish a connection to the CreateDB. I also assume you have data set loaded and yeah, let's see. Now yeah, the most look, interesting part actually comes. It looks like comes. Zoom uh, require, you have to stop sharing and then I can, I can share. Yeah, true. <laughs> I know sometimes it's not an issue. Um, awesome. So this is kind of the, the kind of the demo part of this of this live demo. Um, so this is kind of the dashboard that we showed earlier, a household energy consumption. Um, and so right off the bat, you'll see a few different charts laid out here. And so the way to think about this from kind of a, um, a mental model standpoint is that dashboards, you know, each dashboard has a um, actually dashboards and charts in general have a many to many relationship. So the same chart can live in multiple dashboards. Um, and a dashboard can only have one chart or, or many, right? So it's it's kind of a nice, um, you have a lot of freedom there. You're not really restricted in, uh, there's not a tight coupling from, from chart to dashboard. Um, and so you can even add filters. So here you have a, a time filter that I've added. And so the way this works is you can either have a time filter apply to all time, uh, all of the time columns across multiple charts or just a specific one. So the way I think about it is that every chart in, in, in this dashboard here is essentially a SQL query, right? And uh, so for example, if you, if you look at this query right here, um, this, is what's, this is what's needed to generate um, the, the data, that's to generate uh, the data behind this chart. Uh, so you're kind of doing a date trunk, you're, you're taking a, a column by sum and then grouping by, and then we have a limit here at the end. So each of these charts essentially boils down to 
a query and it's, it's really queries all the way down. Uh, and so even when you add a filter state right here or add other kind of uh, dynamic stuff to your dashboard, all it's doing is kind of mutating and changing the final query that's going to be sent to your database um, when you when you when you do that. Uh, and so now you know now I'll actually show you how to make some of these charts. So what you can do here uh, is just go to View Chart and Explore. And so this is again Explore is our no code interface. So on the left hand side you'll see our metadata browser. And so it's fairly common in BI tools because you want to understand what the data actually looks like, the column types, right? So here. If you go to edit data set, uh, you'll see that it's locked by default just to avoid people making changes in your team um, in ways that could potentially break dashboards. Um, you hit on lock um, and then you can see all the schemas um, that are in this CreateDB instance here. Uh, you can see all the tables as well and you'll see that power consumption is selected. So that's the table that's really powering this chart. Uh, you can also do a virtual SQL. So if you instead for example, let's say you, you've made a chart and you realize that you actually need to pull in information from other tables. You can instead switch to this virtual tab and write, hand write a SQL query um, and use that instead to kind of register a virtual table instead of a physical table um, and, and then kind of uh, be on your way to make the chart itself. You also see information about the semantic layer. So this is uh, by default every Every data set has a, a count star metric. It's pretty, pretty straightforward, but you can add your own. Uh, so this supports aggregate uh, functions right here. Uh, you, and this is a view of all the columns. So this is from the physical database itself. So this is what CreateDB is telling us, is telling Superset um, through, the, through the driver. Uh, you can also add calculated columns, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And lastly, settings. So if you need to do uh, time zone offset. If you want to add information on just what the purpose of the table is um, and stuff like that, uh, you can also change the owner and um, and set a cache timeout. So if you find that if you have a thousand different charts powered by the same data set um, and you're currently bottlenecked in your database, you can set a kind of team wide cache timeout um, so that it's not going to hit your database uh, every time and there's a lightweight cache uh, to help support that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the edit data set. Uh, that's kind of the edit data set view. On the left, you'll see each of the column types. So we have TS, which is just time series. Uh, you have a number of numeric columns like global active power, reactive power, uh, voltage, and information about uh, the usage from each of the sub meters, location, city, longitude, et cetera. Um, and here is the meat of Explore. This is actually where you uh, specify things to craft your chart. So here you can choose from a number of visualizations. So this is a list of all the charts that we have. So it has a lot of the usual suspects. Um, and I will say that Superset really shines for time series, uh, which is also one of the reasons I was kind of attracted to create DB because I know that um, time series is a very popular type of use case for, for create. Uh, and so if you go to um, time series, uh, there's a ton of it has the most number of charts and these charts are incredibly uh, customizable. So it's pretty cool. Making time series charts is really fun in Superset. Uh, in this case, I have this table chart um, and basically the way I've created this chart is uh, by, by selecting, in this case, since we're, it's not a time series chart per se, it's just a table that where we're aggregating values. So the goal here really is to understand just what is the total energy use um, in all these in all these households by type? Um, and so, if you look at the data, if you look at the physical ta uh, tables, you'll notice that that kitchen, laundry, and climate control are actually not they're not in the data if you really think about it. Um, and so, the kind of way that we have to approach this problem, uh, since there isn't a kitchen column, there isn't a laundry column, is you can actually rename these things. Uh, so, the nice thing here is in this metric um, to create this metric. All I've done is is dropped in the submetering column and given it a name. Um, and so just to show how that works, um, we can add this right here and submetering. I believe the first one was kitchen. And so we hit save. Um, and if you only do this column, you'll notice that it only generates, um, it'll only do that column, right? Uh, but if you wanna add in information about the other ones, um, I think the next one is pl 
appliances. I'm trying to remember. And then, actually, let me just go back here. The next one is laundry, not. The next one is laundry. And each time you'll notice that, you know, superset is uh, enriching the query. So here you can see the query that's generated. So in the beginning, we just had some submetering one as kitchen, right? So it's all just classic SQL, uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. And then you do submetering three and we get, I believe the third one is climate control. Um, climate control. The nice thing is you can also rename these columns in the edit data set view if you'd like. Um, and so as you can kind of expect, climate control is gonna be the main type of electricity usage. Um, and so there's other types of customizations you can do, right? So you can do percentage metrics. So if you instead wanted, instead of looking at uh, values, uh, you wanna do percentages, uh, you could do that instead. You can do filters, like if you only wanted to have uh, years from data on 2007 and 2009, uh, for example, then you can you can select that uh, right here itself. So TS in, uh, you know, in this case we have timestamp values, um, but you can kind of convert them to, to year values as well. You can do server pagination if you want. If you're getting a large number of table values, you can have the back end uh, kind of uh, segment each of the pages that are returned. You can choose a row limit. Um, and you can do things like show tat show totals. Uh, if you go to customize, you can kind of do more. So what is the order, right? So let's say you want to put uh, climate control first. You can also do that. You can add a search box. If you have a, if you, this is really useful if you have a large number of records and you want people, you can imagine kind of in a customer service setting or uh, in, in any setting where you have user data, you want people to come in and search for an email or a user, then you can kind of set that here. Uh, we don't need it in this case. And then basically all we have to do now to add it to a dashboard is give it a name and choose the dashboard that we want to add it to. Um, since we've already added it, I kind of uh, won't do it right now, but uh, you kind of get the picture. Uh, so I'll kind of go down next to this time series example here. So this is an area chart, uh, which is one of the, kind of the more interesting charts and superset. The cool thing is you can actually enable a data zoom at the bottom. So even though we do have this time filter over here that applies to all these charts, uh, you can also just zoom in on the specific chart and it and this just updates on the front end. So it's, it's for some kind of lightweight um, interaction that you can add to a chart that's not gonna require a new uh, new query to be kind of re-triggered every time because that's uh, that definitely will tax your, your database. So this one, the way this chart works is using the same kind of familiar semantics as before. We still have the time column here. We still, um, and if you actually look here, um, you know, we had to, uh, we basically chose the, the time series column from earlier. That's why you're not seeing any other, uh, temporal columns because you've already picked time, time series. We have month, so you can actually change this to day if you want, and you'll see a lot of values there. So the area charts are kind of not as useful right at this granularity. So that's why I recommend, uh, depending on the data that you have either month, quarter or year. And so each time all that's happening, um, and I'm logged out, so that's great. <laughs> Let me log back in. This always happens in, in, a, in a demo, right? Let me log back in. Da, da, da. And before you maybe actually I'm, maybe log I'm in again. Hacker. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see this chart and, and actually to conclude, okay, yeah. the lowest consumption is definitely some point in July. Does it mean that people like going yeah. to holidays in July? They're leaving their homes, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's an interesting one. Yeah, because even, uh, it, this is consistent throughout all the years, right, which is kind of cool. Even 2007, 2008, and 2000, 2009 as well. There's always a dip. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Because I also think in some parts, maybe in France, it's not as, maybe it's not as cold. Uh, sorry, not as hot, rather. So maybe they don't need it. Or they're, yeah, or they're just going on vacation. Um, yeah, and so this is this is a time series area chart. Uh, you can also swap this to another type of visualization. So if you don't like lines, if you want to do a smooth line, you can do that instead. Um, you can change the opacity um, as well. So for certain types of charts, if you want to emphasize the differences, uh, you can do that. You can turn off the legend, the data zoom. Um, so the main power, like you know, with with this, is that we're not writing any code. We're not writing D three code. We're not writing JavaScript code. You can get most of the functionalities um, that those tools enable um, just just through uh, the interface. So now that we have this dashboard, 
uh, I think as Maria kind of hinted at, we can actually start to understand uh, the type of data that's there. So let me refresh this. I think that we lost the map here. Um, but yeah, this data set was a lot of fun to play with. It was really interesting to look at. I, I think I always knew that climate control would be the big, biggest usage. I know it is in my life, and it's, it's interesting to see that uh, replicated here as well. So this is kind of the region in France that the data set is sampled from. Uh, and you can kind of zoom down all the way to individual units. Um, and there's an interesting story here, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, around how the raw data actually isn't super set expected the data to be formatted slightly differently. And so there's some kind of last mile data prep you can actually do uh, to help unlock that. Uh, but yeah, as, as Maria mentioned, like we have these dips in July. Um, interestingly enough, December um, is, is going to be the biggest uh, biggest kind of use. And that's not surprising. I'm in Boston and the climate control bills in, in the winter are the highest because we're, we're talking about negative, negative 20 to kind of zero degrees uh, Celsius. Um, so that's, uh, I don't know, what is that? Like negative 10 to 32 for us Americans in Fahrenheit. Um, and we can also filter this down. So if you just wanted to, if you wanted to remove climate control and you just wanted to look at kilowatts used on a monthly basis, uh, across non-climate use cases, um, you can see that uh, even the laundry and like this is pretty interesting. It goes down to almost like zero in laundry and kitchen, so just in below three thousand. So yeah, maybe people are regularly going on vacation. Then uh, not sure what well, I'm not sure what else would be responsible for such a dip. Um, you can also see here. So in this case, this this is interesting, right? We we kind of see that 2006 has this very low value here. And that's, that's because the, the data just doesn't have all 12 months. And so we can go ahead and uh, first let's sort this and we can see that, yeah, there's definitely less data there. So we can just go ahead and filter that out instead of kind of uh, polluting uh, our chart. So we can do something like maybe 2007, um, start there instead, right? Um, let's go back, 2007, we'll do Jan 1st and then um, even in 2010, 2010 has pretty good representation, so we can keep that. Um, we can instead do the last day of 2010 instead. Hit apply, apply filters, and then we'll see no data returned. I wonder why. Uh, did I do something wrong? Um, well, not sure what I did wrong, but usually that works. <laughs> Um, you get the idea. So I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Maybe, maybe a bug on our end. But um, yeah, basically, if you filter the data, then you we can remove this 2006 row entirely uh, from the table, and that'll also apply right here, right? So you can tell from the data that it only has data really from December, so uh, December 2006. So really, we we'd want to filter that out instead of keep it. Um, that's kind of a general picture. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show, right, all these maps are zoomable. So our maps are all hosted through Mapbox. Um, so even if you're not using Preset Cloud, you're using Superset, you, you can just get a free Mapbox API key and add it into your configuration. Uh, we have some documentation on that so that you're not seeing. By default, you'll see, hey, you're missing a Mapbox API key. Last thing I wanted to show was the database connection. So uh, you can ignore the other databases in this list, but um, here we have kind of the, the Create DB instance that we've added, we've obviously grayed out to the, the password. Uh, you can hit test connection, and you'll see that the connection looks good as, as we imagine. And then you can go into the advanced tab and actually um, add other things. So in BI tools, you know, DML, which is data manipulation, is not really recommended. It's not really designed for manipulating data, right? You don't want to do insert statements and, and, and update statements in your BI tool, because it's just really not designed with that in mind. But hey, if you really need to for some occasional um, querying, uh, you can still you can still do that. And here is where, um, as Maria was talking about earlier, uh, we need to add the engine parameters for uh, to, to make sure that it works with SSL. And the last thing is uh, every time any any physical table in Superset, in CreateDB rather than your database, uh, you need to kind of manually publish. And this is kind of a very considerate and deliberate design decision because you can imagine many organizations have thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of tables, having that automatically pollute your data set list would kind of overwhelm people. So uh, the kind of superset decision is let's kind of let people quickly add uh, the tables um, that they need. So you go to the IoT schema, and then from here you can add 
any of the data sets uh, that you want. And that's basically how, um, so even for this, if you filter it down, this is, that's basically how we added this data set as well. And if you go to edit data set, this is the same thing that I showed earlier. Um, another fun thing about uh, these two values right here. And so for people who don't know what super, kind of what the semantic layer is about, it's kind of a concept that's common in BI tools. It's basically a way for you to do some last uh, mile transformation and data prep and also specify kind of sources of truth um, across your organization. So in this case, um, by default, um, the, the way that the location values were formatted was actually the latitude and longitude were combined into a single column. So if you look at location, uh, Superset actually is even confused about what column type it is. Um, and it's one of the trade-offs of abstractions, I suppose, is that it's difficult often to try to build a general solution that works with every single database's kind of intricacies. And so, you know, Superset likes to think about strings and floats um, and timestamps. And so it was kind of confused by the JSON nested dictionary that was there. And so to un unblock the workflow, uh, we just added a create DB SQL transformation. So we're just running the longitude kind of SQL function and on top of the location column, and then the results are stored um, and basically, the, actually, the interesting thing is because it's a semantic layer and it's living virtually, uh, this data has never persisted anywhere. It's just augmented. Every time you're running a query um, through the no-code interface, uh, it's just going to replace every instance of, um, of location with longitude, if you chose that, or, or latitude. So this is kind of one of the, the powerful things you can do, where if your data is just not quite formatted correctly, you can still, you have this nice escape valve you'll notice that that's the same for latitude as well. And then when you look at the raw data, it's gonna be uh, formatted the way that you want. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of Superset and Crate working together. Um, and this is kind of the semantic layer that I talked about earlier, right? So this is an abstraction layer over your base data with, with SQL, um, last mile data transformation. So I don't recommend putting all of your business logic in, in this semantic layer, it's more about um, kind of uh, supporting some last mile transformation. So you don't have to wait two weeks for your data team to fix the column. Uh, you can just kind of unblock yourself. Um, everything I showed works in superset and in preset. Uh, this is kind of a quick plug for, for where I work, which is, which is preset. So we have a free tier. So if this looked interesting to you and you wanted to play with the same data, um, you can try out the, the free tier uh, for preset. It's up to five seats and it's free forever. So definitely kind of a fun way to just uh, jam on data and share it with people without having to, to pay for anything. Um, and so I definitely encourage people to check it out. And yeah, here's our kind of summary slide takeaways. So we have an easy and smooth connection experience between CrateDB. We just had to kind of add that SQL Alchemy uh, URI and add the extra database settings for the SSL and it just worked. Um, standard SQL, uh, which is great. So uh, we, we don't need to do anything kind of exotic or database specific here. Dynamic customizable dashboards. So uh, I think you kind of got a sense for the type of dashboards you can build and how you can make them more dynamic with things like filters. Uh, a lot of visualization options, right? So I kind of showed that gallery of, of maps and chart types that are there. Uh, definitely both, both projects are based on open source software. So uh, we have a massive, you know, I think we're at like 7,000 people in our superset Slack. So we'd love to see people uh, join that and, and continue uh, some discussions and conversations. And you can also say hello to me via DM if you do decide to join. And we also obviously have a great uh, community over at CreateDB as well. Um, and we do have a link to the reference posts. So if you wanted to replicate exactly what we created today, um, head over to the preset blog and uh, follow along with the tutorial. Um, so I think, I think that covers everything we wanted to showcase today. So we can take questions now. Yeah, Sri, thanks a lot for the, for the very insightful demo. So um, I've seen actually there was one question you already answered, whether Superset supports Spark. Um, you said yes, do you want to say a little bit more uh, on, yeah. on this topic? Absolutely. So my, yeah, my quick thing there, I don't want to talk about it too much since it's about another database, yeah. I suppose. So that's why I just answered it there, uh, but I'm happy to address it more generally. Yeah. So bec again, because of SQL Alchemy, right? As long as a database or a data engine or a query engine, or we've even done demos where 
people have built a SQL interface on top of an API or on top of Google Sheets. As long as you can create a SQL translation in the middle, um, that's plenty enough for most of the superset features to work. So yeah, we do work with uh, Databricks um, and it's, it's through the Spark SQL type of functionality. So I believe Databricks has like a, a SQL cloud analytics uh, product. And so it's really kind of designed for that in mind. So I paste, if people kind of um, just search, actually you can go to the superset um, documentation. If you, if you go to our site, you'll see um, every single database that we support. Um, so you'll see CreateDB down here and oh, somehow fortunately Databricks right underneath and you'll see that um, you can do just that using the PyHive um, endpoint, uh, PyHive connector if you'd like, or the recommended way now is the Databricks uh, DB API driver. That's gonna give you a much better experience. Okay, great. The next question, I think it's for me. Um, someone asked, um, can you use common table expressions with CreateDB, uh, more specifically with queries? Uh, so currently, no, this is not really the, the, the it, they're not supported, but stay tuned, uh, check our community, check on our websites. It's probably going to be part of CreateDB in the in the coming weeks or months, it's very high on our on our priority list. So yeah, definitely would like to to support with queries in the near future. Um, the next question uh, is for you, yeah, <laughs> Serini. Um, can you set actions when the user clicks on a data point in a plot? For example, show the related time series data to a feature by clicking on the data point. Yeah, great question. So. Uh, for people who are interested, this is traditionally called cross filtering or dashboard cross filtering. And this is completely possible in preset. It is possible in superset if with some configuration, I think it's behind a feature flag because um, there's still some, some, some kinks and to get things passed in the community, there's a relatively high bar, uh, but on preset cloud, you know, we have our own QEA team and we've gone ahead and enabled it. So yeah. So anytime, I think I actually earlier, I had a, a thing you'll you'll see this um, at the bottom. So this right here, emit dashboard cross filters. And so if you have this enabled, uh, what this will essentially do, uh, the mental model that I that I use is um, whatever kind of uh, filter state that a user is uh, putting in. So let's say they click on. Uh, in this case, I haven't enabled it, but if you enable it and then you click on a given bar, whatever whatever kind of values that are there will then that that those values are then emitted to other charts because remember at the end of the day every chart is just a query right behind the scenes um it's all just kind of text sql queries and so anytime you have um like this column is is emitting like let's say you, you click on this row and you have 2010 plus sub metering one like that intersection that value will then be emitted to all the other charts that also kind of use the same data Basically, and you can also choose um, how you know which charts it, it applies to. So yes, uh, this this feature is a little bit in beta, full disclosure, but we do support cross filtering, uh, and we are working on even more complicated stuff like um, drill down. So being able to click a pie in a pie chart and then finding that exact row in a table, so the, so the raw data set. So this kind of classic cross chart interactions are all being developed, but it is currently possible. Uh, to do in both superset and preset. Okay, um, I don't see more questions in the Q and A actually thread, but I can see some questions in the chat. Uh, maybe we can we can try to answer these. Sure. So the first one could Maggie elaborate on the regions of CreateDB and Elasticsearch index. Um, so initially, CreateDB was based on Elasticsearch. Uh, I think in this very beginning, the CreateDB was running one of the one of the largest, uh, if not the largest, uh, Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, but nowadays, it's completely independent. Uh, it uh, actually uses directly uh, the Lucene project for indexing uh, and and search. And yeah, it actually CreateDB relies on on the same indexes. Uh, uh, as, as implemented by, by Lucene project. So it actually enables CreateDB to do uh, very fast uh, analytical queries, uh, to do full text search, to actually do aggregations. 
Um, this is all thanks to, to, to Lucene. I believe Elasticsearch is also based on Lucene these days. Maybe they do some modifications, not really sure about this. But uh, yeah, I hope this, answer, <laughs> this answers your question. Um, Serini, another question for you. Uh, is Kibana node React code similar? Is there a way to put data into CreateDB from dashboard? So anyway, yeah, so this is, um, I think, the, yeah, this was kind of asked probably before I made my comment about uh, about DML and, and CRUD type of workflows. Yeah, so it's not really, um, there's not really, like, so if you enable DML in that, in your edit database settings for your CreateDB instance and superset, then yeah, you can run insert statements and update and delete statements. Um, you can run kind of these data modification type of statements. I don't, I don't really recommend it because the feedback that you'll get uh, is not very good. Like I recommend using a tool like Data Grip or a real kind of hardcore SQL IDE that's gonna give you a lot more useful feedback if you run into issues. All we can do is just show you the error that's given uh, by the database. Uh, by, by crate. And so it's, it's just not really designed for modifying data. Uh, so I don't really recommend doing it, but if you really wanted to, you can edit your database settings and, and, and override that. Uh, and, and yeah, you can run modification type of settings, but there's no way to, if you want to do more advanced stuff where someone like uploads a CSV, these type of more data portal type of use cases is the word that I use. Um, we don't, that's not something that, that is supported. Any, any type of complex user input right now isn't supported and honestly is unlikely to be supported because if you look at kind of the needs of, of BI tools and, uh, and charts and, and dashboarding tools, uh, it's just not really a common thing that people use. If, if that's really important to you, like these type of uh, create, read, update, delete, CRUD workflows, I recommend instead looking at a tool like Retool, R-E-T-O-O-L. Um, they're not open source, but it's another way to kind of build similar type of things, but it's more about modifying data. To answer your first question is, is Kibana node and React code similar? Yeah, so Superset is, um, the front end code base is, is, it's actually relatively complex. It's, it's even more complex than our back end. Um, but our front end code base is written using React. So we use React for all the components to break things out uh, and for all the kind of dynamic state updating that, that you get to experience. And so React is used under the hood um, nodes used uh, a little bit on the back end, um, and Kibana is kind of you know it's it's more different, uh, but there's no Kibana at all in 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 Superset. Um, so I, ho I hope that answers the question. I also see one more. Marco asks, can a user enable and disable feature flags in Preset? Uh, right now we don't allow that, uh, Marco, because it's um, there's kind of this combinatorial explosion that that happens when you enable certain feature flags together, and it creates kind of weird error states. Uh, and since you don't have access, you know, we're not exposing the CLI, you know, command line raw shell output to you. Um, it, there's just kind of not a great experience yet around enabling feature flags in preset. I think at some point we will enable specific feature flags that'll be exposed in a friendly UI. Um, but our, our kind of goal with preset uh, cloud is to provide a, a good kind of reliable experience that just works. Um, so if there's a specific feature you want enabled, we'd rather figure out how to enable it um, than kind of expose this feature flag type of interface. So we have a great customer service team. So if you have kind of specific features you want enabled, like we can try to make that work, but there isn't kind of an interface for arbitrary enabling of, of feature flags in, in preset because it's a pretty kind of a subpar experience, uh, unfortunately. Okay. No open questions. I think we had a lot of interesting questions, right? And we're yeah. kind of coming to end. I would just like to mention that this recording, uh, that the recording actually of this of this demo is going to be available as well as as the slides. Um, I would like to invite you once again to visit our communities. We are very active, answer regularly questions and, and care about our communities as well. So please, if you have any questions in the future and would like to learn more, don't hesitate to, to contact us. Thank you, Serini. This was a great, uh, great demo. Um, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, looking forward to do something again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye.